The Elder Scrolls is a video series, and the setting of five main games and a number of spin-offs. Despite being a video, it is considered a type 2 game. TG also has a 40k WHFB hack named Scrollhammer, Infinity Hack 2nd Edition, and a number of pen and paper games, notably Moro and PNP and the Usrig, set in the Elder Scrolls universe. Recently, Modiphius created the Elder Scrolls, Call to Arms which features a solid PvE game mode and reflects much of Skyrim on the tabletop, down to the Dragonborn deciding to loot everything in sight whilst their companions are slaughtered by Draugr. Currently only features models from Skyrim, but much like Wasteland Warfare, they'll likely expand it to the other games in due time. Its canon is notoriously unstable and intentionally postmodern. Long story short, Imagine every canon clusterfuck 40k has ever experienced, only there are no additions to draw a neat line between lore changes. And on at least one occasion, time has been known to break an order to allow simultaneous mutually exclusive outcomes. You know how in 40k everything is canon, but not everything is necessarily true here. Nothing is canon and everything is true, especially when it contradicts itself. So histories are intentionally interpretive and unreliable. During the Oblivion Crisis, the Dunmer of House Radoran revived a whole city, Aldrin, which was made out of shell of the Great Scar to fight on their side, as a giant friendly crab. They lost, but it's still badass. The games mainly take place in Tamriel, a continent consisting of nine separate lands. After being buttfucked by the Aelid for several centuries, humanity rises up and overthrow their elven overlords, and took control themselves. Then, a few thousand years later, a man named Tiber Septim steps up and leads his armies to conquer all of Tamriel to found the Third Empire of Sarodial. But instead of exterminating all the elves and beast races, they were allowed to coexist with the other races and a time of prosperity began, ending with the death of Emperor Jean-Luc Picard the Seventh and Maroon's Dagon then began to fuck his way from oblivion into Tamriel, starting a chain of events that resulted in him being kicked back into hell by the Emperor's lost son, Sean Bean. Being Sean Bean meant he died in the process, and without an Emperor the Empire began to crumble. The Old Marie Dominion, think Aelid 2.0 sensed their weakness and began a war to subjugate the lesser races. The Empire only barely managed to stop them, and a tense ceasefire is currently in effect. The fluff of the series, unfortunately, suffers greatly from dissonance between written background and shown foreground due to all the shit mentioned in the intro. There's also a bunch of other weird cosmology crap involved. But it's all kind of trippy and kind of in a grey area when it comes to canon. Don't think too much about it. Unless you're into that. The setting works if you don't care for it, and it works if you do. The games themselves don't acknowledge the deeper lore outside some in-game books and a few references thrown in some main story dialogue. Expand if you do want to read on some of the, possibly, weirdest, at times incomprehensible, yet at times original without being subversive because we can lore ever written. Gods deities and other important people. Most of the gods in the Elder Scrolls are Etida, the original spirits that came from the interplay of Anu and Padome. These spirits later depending on their alignment with creation got categorized into Idra and Idra. If you took part in creation of Nern you are Idra. If you were egotistic dick and went to oblivion to make your small shitty realm, you are Didra. Supreme gods, the godhead, everything in the setting is all just the, the godhead's dream. If you believe all of the weird lore, fully comprehending this fact will either cause you to lose your sense of individuality and disappear, or give you the ability to change the world around you like a lucid dreamer, or cause you to exit the universe and create your own. Anu and Padme are the godhead's first creations. Anu, the personification of light, life, stasis, and order, rarely is worshipped due to his lack of personality but most religions acknowledge his existence. Hardly does anything because he removed himself and Padme from reality to stop Padme from causing more destruction. Padme, the personification of darkness, death, change, and chaos. In the beginning of the universe he attacked Anu and the spilt blood of the two became new gods. While also rarely worshipped, he, or rather, one of his self-projections, known as Sithis, 
is considered the patron of the Dark Brotherhood assassins. Some vampires and even regular Argonians are known to worship him under various names as well. Idra, the Idra, our ancestors in Ordmaris, are Etida of Anuic origin. Many of them took part in the creation of Nern, during which they died. Their essences fuse together into Mundus. As such they do not have physical forms like the Deidre have. Yet their spirits live on in Nern. As the gods of the world they live in every part of it. While not as focused as their Deidre counterparts they are more widespread, worshipped and give their blessings and artifacts more freely than the Deidre. Plus they have control over one realm that everyone wants to have, Nern. Eight of the Deidre are worshipped in Tamriel as the Eight Divines. Along with the human god hero Tiber Septim, Akka, Talos, to make the more assonant nine divines, a fusion of the old Nordic pantheon and the Edra worshipped by the Aelids, Akatosh, also known as Auriel to the Altmer, Alkosh to the Kjite, and the father of the dragons, the chief deity of the eight and the top god of the Sarodi Ilic Empire as he represents duty, legitimacy, endurance and obedience, but his different identities also have additional roles. Akatosh proper is the god of time, but Auriel is the god of the sun, which it is worth noting can be used as a timekeeping device. All the other gods also work like this, as divinity in this setting is weird. His artifacts are Auriel's bow and Auriel's shield, which have completely different powers depending which game you are playing. In the Skyrim Dawn Good DLC, the bow infuses arrows fired from it with the power of the sun to do more damage to the undead, and the shield can absorb energy from attacks it blocks and release it as waves similar to the unrelenting force shout. If your first question was how one guy can wield both a shield and a bow, then take your Ritalin, because you obviously haven't been paying attention. RK, Lord of the Wheel of Life, Master of Life and Death, Burials and Funeral Rites, has two origin stories. The boring one is that he was one of the first Ilnofi, or Earthbones, and the not boring one, where he was a mortal shopkeeper obsessed with knowledge, who got his hands on a book that explained life and death and on his death prayed to Mara, who raised him up as a god to keep the balance of life and death in the universe. RK's priests are some of the fiercest necromancer hunters around, as those foul practices are an affront to their god, Debella, goddess of beauty affection and the carnal and sexual aspects of love, as well as art and music. Effectively Nern's equivalent of Aphrodite, she teaches that, no matter the seed, if the shoot is nurtured with love, will not the flower be beautiful oh boy. Her artifact is the brush of true paint, which can turn a canvas into a portal to a world made of paint that the artist creates with their imagination. Julianus, god of wisdom and logic, literature, law, History and contradiction are the domains of Julianus. Though Magnus is the god of magic, many wizards worship Julianus. The scholarly Bretons also hold a particular reverence for him. Monastic orders dedicated to Julianus are the keepers of the Elder Scrolls. Kynareth, goddess of heavens, winds and the elements. Known as Kyn among the Nords and the Widow of Shore. It is said that Kyn gifted men with the Thursday um so they could harness the power of dragons and save themselves from Akatosh's errant children. Her artifact is the Lord's Mail, a cuirass that grants its wearer healing, magicka absorption, and the ability to cure their self of poison. Mara, goddess of agriculture, compassion, fertility, and the more romantic aspects of love. She is the one deity that is recognized by every culture on Tamriel. Among the Nords, Mara is Kynes handmaiden and Shaw's bit on the side. Among the Altmer, Bosmer and Bretons, Mara is the wife of Akatosh Uriel. Among the Reduids, Mawa was a fertility goddess with four arms to grab more husbands with. Among the now extinct Cathringi of Black Marsh, Mara was just one of three aspects to an older mother goddess with Kynareth and Abella as the other two aspects. As said above, divinity in this setting is weird. Whatever the case, weddings in Tamriel are overseen by priests of Mara. Stender, god of mercy, charity and justice, apologist of men and patron deity of the Imperial Legion and many Breton knightly orders. Stender welcomes heretics the afflicted, hopeless and forgotten just as readily as his devout followers. However his mercy ends at the enemies of mortals, the abhorrent and unnatural. Stender's priests are often hunters of lesser Deidre, 
lycanthropes, vampires and undead. Real bro to god overall. His artifact is Stender's hammer. A hammer that increases the user's stamina and does incredible damage, but is also very fragile and far too heavy for a mortal to use. Xenifer, god of honest work and commerce. The almighty dollar taken to the end conclusion. Very strong ties to the people of Serodial. And many in High Rock and Hammerfall too. Talos, not actually an Edra, but worth mentioning as he is often placed among the other eight. Talos. Known in life as Tiber Septim and Esmit of the Nords, is the greatest god hero of mankind. He conquered all of Tamriel and ushered in the third empire of Serodial at the end of the second era. When he died, his spirit supposedly ascended to godhood, and a quest in Oblivion lends support to this. As of the fourth era, Talos' worship is banned in the empire as per the terms of the white gold concordat made with the Dominion. Because the idea of a man becoming a god pisses the stupid sparkly prisses off to no end. That, and it is also likely that Talos is helping to hold the world together. And the Tharma know this and want to starve him of worship, effectively destroying all known to regain the divinity Lorcan is said to have stolen from them. Fucking elves. Although worshipped mainly by the Nords during the fourth era, his race is unknown, but he was most likely a Breton. The Altmer also worship or at least acknowledge, other era that don't belong to the eight divines above, but are worshipped in most elven lands, these being, Jeffa, the god of songs and forests and the spirit of now, also called Wyfren. He was one of the first spirits to become Ilnofi, and set in place the rules of nature and life from Nern. The Bosma consider him their main god and he's the reason they're carnivores and cannibals. Lorcan. The creator trickster tester god present in every race's mythology. Known alternatively as Lork Hajj, Shaw, Sheer, Sep, or Sheza. Every single version goes the same way. Creation happens. Other spirits and gods get pissed at him. He's bound. He's killed torn to pieces separated from his divine center and forced to wander the earth. His heart landed in Red Mountain and was destroyed in Morrowind. And some say that his corpse became the two moons of Nern. Magnus, the god of magic and the supposed architect of creation. When he realized what he made, he ran the fuck away, ripping a hole through creation to Aetherius, with this hole becoming the sun. Some part of him got caught in creation though, becoming the force of magic. He also had a host of assistants called the Magma Jet, who ripped similar holes in creation when running away these becoming the stars. Very little lore exists about the magma jet, and believe us it reads like a mushroom trip. His associated artifact is the Staff of Magnus, which has the power to drain Magicka, and possibly the Eye of Magnus, a mysterious floating orb of incredible power whose purpose is unclear, though may have been one of the tools Magnus used to create the world. Finaster, an ancestor god of the Altmer, Though some Bretons also worship him, who taught them how to live another 100 years by using a shorter walking stride. Cirobane, another ancestor god of the Altmer, who aided men in destroying the slowed kingdom of Thras. Often called the Apprentice's God, as the younger members of the Mages Guild worship him. Trinimac, the warrior god of the ancient Altmer, who lead armies against the men. He eventually got eaten by both the and became Malakith. More below, Xarxes the scribe Toriel, and the god of ancestry and secret knowledge. He made his wife Oma. No, not that one. From his favorite moments in history, Hermemus Mora claims that Xarxes used to be his servant and created the Oma Infinium, a massive book containing all knowledge that one desires. Deidre, not our ancestors in Aldmeris and our stronger, better ancestors in Dunmeris. The Deidre, singular, Deidreth not to be confused with a crocodile-like Deidre called Deidreth, are the Etida who did not partake in the creation of the world. Because they didn't quasi-suicide themselves to pour their essence into the world, their power is both more focused, but their power on none is more limited compared to their Edric counterparts. As such their powers are limited to the likes of curses and artifacts, and can only walk the realm in forms that severely limit their powers. Or so they say. Diedrich princes instead have their own singular realms. The realms of oblivion. A Diedrich prince is omnipotent within their realm. Because it is part of them and their mind. Their own realms are made out of them. Similar to how none is made out of Edra. 
The Dido are still fully alive and have much greater control over their own realm. But the Tadiaf is that each realm is pretty small, despite serving as the setting's devils. In that the word Dido pretty much means devil. They are not all completely evil. They range from hates undead and wants to hunt dangerous game to prince of destruction and king of rape. Even if they are benevolent at times, the Dibra are not to be trifled with and are very dangerous. Azura. The Dibra associated with periods of change, twilight in particular, and magic and prophecy. Allegedly Nocturnal's sister, and one of the few Dibra not to be considered evil. Though she is intensely prideful and easily aggravated, treating the Dunma with a character not unlike how our Old Testament Yahweh treated the 12 tribes of Israel. Azura is worshipped by the Dunma and Kajiite, though she had a mutual hatred for the Dwema. Her realm of oblivion is Moonshadow, a beautiful place of silver cities, gardens, and perpetual twilight. Her artifact is Azura Star. An item which can hold the souls of living creatures. If this sounds like the soul gem items found across the series, it is. But Azura's star is a max capacity soul gem that doesn't get consumed upon use, and is thus reusable. Both the act, the diva associated with deceit, ambition, treachery, competition and sedition, goes hand in hand with Mephrila and is basically her louder sibling. Despite sounding like some kind of fucked up noble. Both the eye often takes the appearance of a patrician warrior, can be female, but usually male, and enjoys inflicting mayhem and bloodshed on mortals. Regarded by the Dunma, either through worship or hatred, some versions of their origin tale have all sorts of scholarly pursuits emerging from their teachings. Their realm is Attribution Share, also known as Snake Mount. A place of labyrinthine policies and betrayals. Their artifacts are Goldbrand, a high-end katana, and the ebony mail. High-end armor that cloaks the wearer in shadow and causes poison damage to those around them. Clavicus Vile, the Deidre associated with wishes and pacts. He's the arsehole genie who ensures that all the wishes and pacts are twisted so he comes out on top. Usually while gaining the soul of the one foolish enough to deal with him. He appears as a jovial fellow with horns sprouting from his forehead, and is usually accompanied by Barbos. A dog who holds half of Clavicus' power and functions as his conscience. His realm is the Fields of Regret, which, despite its name, is a tranquil countryside, dotted with cities of glass and ornate buildings. His artifacts are the Mask of Clavicus Vile, which makes its wearer more popular and likable, and the Butter Cup, a cup that enhances the owner's strengths, while also exacerbating their weaknesses. Hermalius Mora. The Deidre are associated with fate and forbidden knowledge. Supposedly the sibling of Mephila, he seeks to gather and obtain as much knowledge as possible. He often appears as a collection of eyes, tentacles, and pincers. Proper Lovecraftian Mephifica. His realm is Apocrypha, an endless library filled with and made from books of forbidden knowledge, with seas of ink, alien geometries, and tentacles everywhere. His artifacts are the Black Books which transport their reader to Apocrypha and can grant access to forbidden knowledge, and the Oma Infinium, a tome that can allow one to achieve near demigod level abilities. Her sign, the Deidre associated with hunting and thievery anthropes. He created the many wearer beasts that exist in Tamriel, and claims their souls upon death. He appears either as an animal or a man with the horns of a deer, unless he appears as a deer. His realm is the hunting grounds. A place of dense woodlands and vast grasslands, inhabited by Deidre, beasts, and theory anthropes, where werebers and nords hunt by day, and her sign along with a pack of werewolves hunts by night. His artifacts are the savior's hide, a hide cuirass that makes the wearer more resistant to magic, and the ring of her sign, a ring that allows one to transform into a werewolf, if not already a lycanthrope and lycanthropes to control their transformations, unless they stole it, in which case the ring fucks them over by forcing them to transform at random. Malakath, the diva associated with orcs, goblins, ogres, curses, and outcasts. Definitely a good diva if you happen to be an orc, but to other races he's benign at the best of times, although he's never outright malevolent to the degree of Molog or Merunes. He technically is not a Diedric prince, and the other Diedric princes don't count him as one of them, 
which is fitting for a patron of outcasts because his origin makes him an Edra, but he often is counted as a Diedric prince because he rules over a realm of oblivion. Originally he was Trinimac, one of the ancestor spirits of the Altmer, who was eaten by both the and then shat out as Malakith. Though he says the story is too literal minded and there are those who say that Trinamak and Balakath are two separate deities. He appears as a muscular orc wielding a heavy weapon. His realm is Ashpit, a realm of dust and ash, dotted with palaces of smoke and gardens, where levitation and magical breathing are necessary to survive. His artifacts are the Scourge, a mace that banishes all Deidre that make contact with it, and Volundrung. A Dwemer made Warhammer. Merun's Dagon, the diva associated with destruction, revolution, change, ambition, and energy. One of the more evil diva, of whom little is known, and the antagonist of Battle Spire and Oblivion. He appears as a red skinned giant with four arms, carrying a two headed axe. His realm is the Deadlands. No, not that one. A hellscape of scorched volcanic islands and ruined structures amidst a sea of lava with hostile life living on the islands. He once was a good guy before a curse was put on him by Alduin for interfering with his devouring of the world. His artifact is Merun's razor, a dagger that has a small chance of instantly killing whatever it cuts. Mephila, the diva associated with spiders, webs, lies, secrets, Plots and murder. Sibling to Hermaeus Mora, the Dunmer worship her as one of the good Deidre, with her having taught them the arts of stealth and assassination. The Morag Tong, the Assassin's Guild in Morrowind, worships her through murder. She often appears as a female of some form, but sometimes appears as a male. Her realm is the Spiral Skein, a wheel-shaped realm with her palace in the middle and the space between the spokes dedicated to one of eight sins. Her artifacts are the Ring of KGIT, a ring that makes its wearer faster and harder to detect, and the Ebony Blade, a life-leeching katana. Meridia, the diva associated with light and the energies of living things, and one of the few non-evil Daedric princes. She was originally believed to have been one of the Magna Jack, the spirits that followed Magnus to Aetherius, it was cast out for consorting with Deidre, eventually creating her realm by bending and shaping the light of the sun. She hates all undead with a passion and usually rewards those who destroy them. She either appears as an orb of light or a blonde haired woman in a gown. Despite all this, she generally does not command popular worship due to her haughty, bitter and aloof manner. Stemming from her exile from the Magna Gem. The last time she threw her support behind a mortal race she made the mistake of being the patron of the Heartland High Elves of Cyrodiil, who were into human slavery and were generally tyrants. They ended up being near exterminated. There are hints in the lore that Moloch Bal is obsessed with her and caused her fall from heaven. Her realm is the Colored Rooms. A cross between a coral reef and a field of floating stones, strewn with colorful trails of dust clouds. Her artifacts are the Ring of KGIT and the Dawnbringer, a sword that burns the undead and upon killing them makes them explode. Moloch Bal, the diva associated with domination, enslavement, rape, and vampires. Quite inarguably the most evil of the Diedric princes as he simply desires to harvest souls of mortals by inciting strife and discord among them. He also created the first vampire by raping a Nedic woman. He appears as a monstrous being of varying appearance, but usually has horns and hooves. His realm is Cold Harbor, which is an apocalyptic and desolate reflection of known where the air is freezing. Every wall is smeared with blood and shit and there are charnel houses and slave pens as far as the eye can see. His artifact is the Mace of Moloch Bal, a mace that drains the energies of those it hits and traps their souls upon death. Main antagonist of both the original game and Elder Scrolls Online, with Merun's Dagon basically stealing his invasion plans. Seriously Merun's invades Nern in the same ways in the same order. Namra, the diva associated with ancient darkness, revulsion, and cannibals. Not much is known of her, other than she's associated with anything revolting, and her followers prefer to live in dark and squalid conditions. Her realm is the scuttling void, of which nothing is really known about. Her artifact is the Ring of Namra, a ring that boosts one health after cannibalizing a corpse, or reflects damage back onto the wearer's attacker. Nocturnal, the diva associated with darkness, night, 
Luck and thieves. Most thieves in Tamriel revere her to some degree, for obvious reasons. And the thieves guild reveres her as their patron. She appears often as a dark haired woman in a hooded gown, accompanied by ravens. Her realm is Evergloam, a realm in perpetual twilight, consisting of a primary plane and constantly shifting pocket planes. Her artifacts are the skeleton key, a key lockpick that can open anything from locks to portals to one's hidden potential. The Grey Cowl of Nocturnal, a cowl that hides the wearer's true identity and makes him a better thief, and the Bow of Shadows, a bow that can turn its wielder invisible. Periite, Nurgle's less jovial cousin, this is the Deidre associated with tasks, pestilence, and natural order. Periite is considered one of the weakest Deidre princes, not that any Deidre prince can be called weak by mortal standards and is charged with keeping the lower realms of oblivion and the lesser Deidre in line. He often appears as a green, four-legged dragon, but sometimes appears as ghostly apparitions of vermin. His realm is the pits, which resembles more like Bal's deadlands in its landscape. His artifact is a spellbreaker, a dwemer shield that can reflect magic. Sanguine, basically just a less rapi or the ice gusting slanesh. The Deidre associated with hedonism. Debauchery indulgence, and revelry. He's often depicted on seals and signs of brothels and whorehouses. He appears as a portly dremora, with a bottle in one hand and a whore in another. His realms are the myriad realms of revelry, countless pocket realms that are fashioned to meet the needs and demands of their visitors. His artifact is the Sanguine Rose, a rose-shaped staff staff-sized rose that summons a dremora to fight for its owner. Chiagareth, everyone's favorite. This is the lore and an chaotic stupid dealer associated with madness and creativity. There are many stories and legends about him, like how he invented music from the body parts of a woman he killed and how he trolled every one of the other Diedrich princes at various points. He appears as an elderly, well-dressed gentleman with a nice beard and a cane. His realm is the Shivering Isles. A landmass surrounded by islands that divided in two to represent both shades of madness. His artifact is a Wowber Jack, a staff that does something completely random when used. He is distinguishable from other Deidre by the fact that old Shiogareth was basically a result of Jigalag getting his ass kicked by the other Deidrek princes and new Shiogareth was mortal at one point. The hero of Kvatch is named the new Shiogareth by a grateful Jigalag once his curse is lifted and going by Shiogareth's dialogue in Skyrim as well as him fondly remembering his other adventures back then, this event is canon. Jiglag, the lawful stupid Deidre associated with logic, order, and deduction. Originally, he was the most powerful of the Deidre princes, but the others cursed him to become Shiogareth, who represented everything he hated. The curse did allow him to return at the end of every era, leading the event known as the Greymark and obliterating the Shivering Isles only to revert back to Shiogareth and start the process all over again. This seemingly never-ending cycle of torment finally ended when Shiogareth managed to lure the hero of Kvatch to the Shivering Isles and successfully train them to hold the Greymark and take up the mantle of Majid. By the end of the Shivering Isles expansion, Jigalag is defeated by the protagonist, thus finally lifting the curse. He then heads off to parts unknown but not before naming the hero of Kvatch as the new Shiogareth. He has yet to make a reappearance in the games despite his DLC being canon. He appears as a giant, grey knight wielding an Xbox hug fuck of sword. Vermina, the Deidre associated with dreams and nightmares. One of the more evil Deidre, with some saying that torture also belongs to her sphere of influence. She appears as an old woman in a robe, wielding a staff. Her realm is Quagmire. A nightmarish realm where Vermina draws the minds of mortals, collecting their memories and leaving nightmares in return. Her artifact is the Skull of Corruption, a staff that creates a clone of the target who then attacks its original. Other divinities, Etida and other gods that don't belong to either group also exist. Some of the more important ones being, Alduin, the firstborn of Akatosh and his destroyer aspect, who most believed was just the Nordic version of Akatosh. His job is to bring about the end of the current Kalpa so that the next one may begin. But by the time of Skyrim, he's decided to just rule over the world. You defeat him at the end of Skyrim, but unlike any other dragon, his soul is not absorbed by the dragonborn. 
leaving many believing he'll return one day to do his job properly. Allmaker. Another name for Anu, the god of the skull and the source of all life. The skull believe that when you die you go to him, and he reincarnates you as new being. Oneness, or harmony, with nature is important, as the skull draw their magical powers from it and it pleases the Allmaker. Opposing him is the adversary, a many aspected god who torments and tests the skull. Dagatha, the main antagonist of Morrowind. He was once the trusted advisor of Nerova until he experimented with the heart of Lorcan and managed to draw power from it. By the events of the game he is properly batchet loopy with divinity, and also without question the most dangerous thing on Nern because he exists within a terrifying middle ground between Shim, Zero Sum and Amaranth. He has godlike power because of his agonist of Anu's dream but cannot maintain his individuality or fade into the dream. So his broken, traumatized mind is being slowly imprinted on the dream of Anu. Nevertheless, he seemingly dies by the hand of Nerova's reincarnation after you sever his connection to the heart. Affable and almost as infinitely quotable as Shiogareth. Farnuthen, Demi-Prince, Weed, Debrick Demigod, of swordsmanship and son of Bothia, taught then unborn Vivek how to fight by combining with seven other Debra called barons who move like this and turning into a pillar of fighting styles. You meet him in Ezo where you help restore his failing memory. The ideal masters, once mortal spillcasters during the Marethic era, they forsook their mortality and physical forms to become beings of pure soul energy. In the process however, they found they had become filled with a terrible hunger for souls. The ideal masters are the source of all soul gems, and of the arts of soul trapping, and therefore enchantment. Their private realm within oblivion. The soul can, is where every soul that is ever trapped in a soul gem goes. They rarely bother manifesting at all, though a few gigantic crystals in the can channel their influence and their hunger. Their name comes from their belief that, by removing mortal souls from the cycle of rebirth and trapping them in eternal undeath, they are ultimately granting all beings eternal peace. And there is a small amount of evidence to support this. Despite all this, they aren't really ambitious, and they even helped the hero of Battlespire because they were tired of Merun's Dagon driving across their lawn on the way to the mortal world. Manamarco, an old and powerful Altman necromancer and lich supposedly became the god of necromancy after the events of Daggerfall and returns as the main antagonist for the mage's guild questline in Oblivion. More a horse, demigod son of Kynareth who appeared as a winged man bull, help Alesha overthrow the Aelids and establish the Alesian Empire. Also the supposed progenitor of Minotaurs, having been born from the union of him and Alesha. The Tribunal, also known as the Alms of E, they were originally three Chima, the predecessors of Dunmer, Almalekshire, Sothasil, and Vivek, and counselors to Nerva, who also stole their powers from the heart of Lorcan, and promptly ruled over the Dunmer from early mid first era to the end of the third era. Almalekshire eventually went insane and killed Sothasil, but Nerevarine killed her, and Vivek got dragged to Oblivion during the events of Oblivion. Without the influence of a tribunal, the Red Mountain erupted and Morrowind promptly went to shit. Sun, the Nordic god of trials against adversity and shores shield Thane. He died fighting against foreign, reed, elven, gods and was then assigned to be the guardian of the whalebone bridge leading to the Hall of Valor in Sovngood. You get fight him for your right to enter the Hall in Skyrim. Sithis, another name for Padome, the primordial manifestation of chaos and entropy, exists somewhere outside of the bounds of the cosmos and is practically feared by nearly everyone, given that it represents death and the eventual end of all things, inhabits a pocket dimension called the void, the dark brotherhood have a peerless connection to Sithis, the only entities who come close are actually trees known as Hist, and all things slain through their assassinations ends up in its realm. Basically the god of many faces from a soif mixed with Shiva, the Hindu god of destruction. To contact Sithis, one must perform the Black Sacrament, an offering of human flesh, bones, and heart. If Sithis accepts, it passes on the information about the sacrament and who it was intended for. To the Night Mother, a now mummified corpse that is intimately connected to Sithis, who then in turn will pass it on to the leader of the Dark Brotherhood, called the Listener. 
named that way because only listeners can actually hear what the night mother says, and then passes the contract onto the field operatives of the Dark Brotherhood. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk. One stop shop for coom jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smut models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and dnd 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. The first two Elder Scrolls games had 8 playable races. The three after that added Imperials and Orcs as playable races. There's also a ton of unplayable races as well, but Usp can explain them better than us. The races of Tamriel are generally divided into three categories. The races of men are the various ethnicities of human. The mare races are the different species of elf. And the beastmen are the races native to Tamriel. Men. A Kaverit CC. Fantasy Japanese. Not directly presented in game. But their spirits may be seen in certain missions. Left a significant mark in Imperial history. As a cavalry invaders were on a mission of search of Dragonborn. Which turned out to be founder of the Second Empire. Reman. They swore allegiance to him and served as elite guard of his descendants. These names are interchangeably used. But some sources imply that a cavalry and CC are actually different group of people. With CC being snake-like. Even Naga, perhaps. As for how is it possible to have snake humans? Well, dwarfs and orcs and most bizarrely, some imply that Kgite are simply a subspecies of elves here. So just roll with this. One source suggests the human or cavalry were devoured by that CC but whether that means they were literally all eaten or simply enslaved or culturally assimilated is anyone's guess. Bretons. Best described as half-elves from Britannia with a hint of Frenchness. Probably the least baddest of the humans here, which is all relative. Many great heroes throughout Tamriel's history were Bretons including several of Sir Odile's emperors, but they are still the most gifted with magic because of their elf blood. They even get a magic resistance out of the deal. True to the French stereotype, they are great cooks but also a bit snobby. Their home province of High Rock isn't even a United Kingdom but rather a patchwork quilt of petty kingdoms, embroiled in political conflict and usually only tangentially aligned with the empire at the best of times. Reachmen, tribal people of Breton descent native to the reach, the Celts to Bretonians above, used to rule a bunch of petty kingdoms in the area before being subjugated by the Elysian Empire first, and later by Tiber Septim. By the 4th era they tried to take the reach again but Ulfric Stormcloak put a stop to that in the now infamous Markarth incident that gave rise to the Stormcloak rebellion. Now split between those trying to just live their lives in peace, and the Forsworn, raiders who went back to the old ways of using fur and hide armor, weapons of stone, bone, and wood, and worshipping the Deva and venerating Hagraves. Witches who gave their humanity to become powerful spillcasters. Imperials. Also known as the Sarodi Isles. The Imperials are a civilized and cosmopolitan people. More or less Roman in culture. But in very early lore they were actually Mesoamerican. And their ancestors the Nids were ancient Chinese and some still see themselves as ethnically a cavalry. Like practically all humans in fantasy settings. They are average at nearly everything control the world, and are kind of boring compared to everyone else. They've forged three continent spanning empires in their history, the first with the help of an actual terminator, Schwarzenegger, not these guys, and the third by using a time bending magical giant robot. They've also had a space race with the Ultima to colonize Massa and Secunda, and exchanged threats of orbital bombardment. Yes, really. Surprisingly, for most of the third era, most emperors were not imperials, but Bretons. Neds, the progenitors of the Bretons and imperials, and possibly the Nords. Where they came from is a matter of lively debate, 
with the competing theories stating they either arrived on Tamriel long before the Nords, or else were the Atmoran ancestors of the Nords. What is known is that while on Tamriel they took beatings from just about everyone, notably the Reduids wiping them from Hummerfall and the Aelids enslaving them across the Rodial. Nords, on the surface, basically manly as all hell, magic and elf hating not Vikings from the frozen land of Skyrim. Under the surface, a deeply intolerant, xenophobic and warlike people that would have ran their society into extinction long ago if they hadn't been conquered by smarter people tend to be very very badass because they have to live in an inhospitable hellhole with bears, saber tooth cats, trolls, giants, big nopey frost spiders the size of bears and they also fought and killed almost all the dragons in the past. Their ancestors, the Admorans, nearly exterminated the entire snow elf race with just 500 warriors despite being basically cavemen with no understanding of agriculture or the written language, going up against an iron age civilization with magic. The Nords then fell in line behind a badass named King Vridge the Gifted and went full Genghis Mathurfa King Khan on Tamriel, conquering a vast empire that fell apart when his grandson Borgus died and Skyrim fell into a succession crisis. Not much happened afterwards. The Nords fought, won and lost a few wars against the Dunmer, the Dwemer, the Akavari and themselves until Tiber Septim rocked up and folded them into his third empire. Skull, Nords native to Sol's theme. Split between those trying to live like the Nords of olden times, weed, fighting, drinking, and hunting like there's no tomorrow, and those living in harmony with nature and worshipping the Allmaker through it. Reduit. Fantasy Moors Africans. But with the sword reverence of the Japanese. Skilled warriors hailing from the sunken islands of Yakuda, which they apparently nuked out of existence by being so good with a sword they could cut individual atoms, and the only guys to have invented gunpowder. Daggerfall mentions their ships have cannon. Rajwoods are some of the greatest sailors in Tamriel, and they tend to scorn magic due to religious taboos against necromancy in their many past wars with the magic proficient Bretons. This dislike faded over time and by the fourth era, destruction and restoration magic have obtained widespread acceptance due to their straightforwardness. Mare, Elves, Alpma, High Elves. Every stereotype of elves being narcissistic pricks, amplified a hundredfold. As of the fourth era, their home of Somerset Isle, now Lina, is governed by the farmer, who are out to unravel all creation because they believe mortality was a cruel trick played on them by the gods of men. And no, this belief is not just some quirk of the farmer, the ancient Aldma believed this as well. They even practice eugenics, wear long black coats and kill any undesirable progeny. It is suggested that they don't even have names among themselves, they just assign each other a long number that sounds like a name to human ears. These claims may also be just propaganda, though some of them are certainly true. Nearly every Altmer is either a wizard or a magical warrior. Aelids, Heartland High Elves, an offshoot race from the Aldmer, the ancestors of the Aldmer, notable for being the original founders of the Imperial City and the founders of the First Empire in Tamriel. Also notable for worshipping the Deva and torturing their Nedic slaves in nightmare fuel ways for shits and giggles, like skinning runaways alive, making gardens and sculptures out of their guts and bones, setting human children on fire. The kind of thing. If the Imperials are Romans then the Aelids were the Etruscan kings who ruled Rome prior to the founding of the Roman Republic. The Neds eventually rebelled under leadership of Alesha and exterminated large portions of them, while the remaining Aelids who refused to fight would live as vassals of the newly formed First Empire of Humanity. Then, after a while, a literal intellectual guerrilla formed a sect which basically stated that men should have exterminated every single elf. Thus the remaining Aelids fled to other elven lands and were absorbed into the other elven races, and the forests of Sarodial where they split into many tribes and kept away from others. Bosma, Wood Elves, Wood Elves and the Dwarf Fortress Sense, only not quite as insane. They are some of the greatest archers in Tamriel and they have a long history of warring with the Kjite. They also happen to be cannibals because of an ancient pact they made with the forest god Wifra forbidding them from eating plant matter on pain of turning into that which shall not be named. 
so they are the total opposite of the vegan elf stereotype. They have been known to use the aforementioned transformation trick in mass if their homeland of Valenwood is Threatenon. And surprisingly, Bosma have no understanding of woodworking and brew alcohol from animal sources, ranging from pig's milk to the fermented flesh of their dead enemies. Hardcore. As a note on the cannibalism thing, you don't actually have to worry about getting shanked and eaten by every wood elf you meet meat. It's just their standard means of dealing with dead bodies. Dunmer. Dark elves. Elves with a blue-gray tint to their skin who got cursed by one of their Diedrich patrons for complex reasons. Their culture is a bizarre mishmash of China, Japan, Mongolia, ancient Mesopotamia and the biblical Israelites, with northern English accents, and a distinct gravelly voice for the men. They primarily revere the Diedrich along with the tribunal, three mortals who ascended to godhood by tapping into the heart of Lorcan. Since they joined the empire by treaty instead of by conquest, their homeland of Morrowind has many unique laws, including inquisitors and, till the tail end of the third era, legalized slavery. Highly supremacist and xenophobic, the fourth era has bitten them in the ass hard as most of Morrowind was devastated by volcanic eruption and their Argonian slaves have occupied what's left leaving most surviving Dunmaras and welcome refugees. How the mighty have fallen. Dwemer. Deep elves. Elves who lived in the northern mountain ranges. They studied the process of creation in great detail and became the most advanced race to have existed, having figured out steam power and electricity, created steam electrically soldium powered automata, and invented tonal architecture. The manipulation of sound to alter reality. Even though they are for all intents and purposes dwarfs, they were actually human sized. They were called dwarfs by the giants of Tamriel. A very strong contender for the single most baddest race in Tamrielic history, besides the early Nords and the modern Argonians. Their belief system was terrifyingly alien even to the other inhabitants to the continent and they were seen as arrogant and dogmatic, hated and dreaded by every other race they met. They were atheists in a world where the existence of the gods is indisputable fact, which should tell you all you need to know about how crazy and also kind of badass, they were. Relatively early into the first era, all Dwemer on Nern disappeared after they activated the Numidium, a massive time-bending robot powered by the heart of Lorcan. There are multiple hypotheses to explain the exact mechanism of their disappearance. They may have become the armored skin of Numidium or the metaphysical concept of negation itself, ascended to another plane outside of Aetherius where not even Vivek can sense them sent themselves forward in time, or just botched their attempt at reforging themselves into gods at the reduce ourselves to base elements part of the process, going poof as a result. Farmer, snow elves, light haired and pale skinned elves originally native to Skyrim, they got their asses kicked so hard by the Admorans they went into hiding, with most going to the Dwemer for shelter. What the Dwemer didn't tell them was that shelter meant being enslaved and forced to eat addictive toxic fungi that make you blind, and not the manageable grey eyes blindness. No, it's full on your eyelids grow together Hellraiser style blindness. Several generations of this diet and other factors eventually turned them into blind, noseless. Hunchbacked, barely sentient subterranean goblinoid degenerates. A small number of farmer did escape being wiped out by the Atmorans or enslaved by the Dwemer in an isolated part of Skyrim, until one of them ended up becoming a vampire and went crazy with anger at being cut off from his god and killed all of the others except for his brother. After the player kills him in the Dongu DLC, his brother may be the last remaining uncorrupted farmer in existence. Unless there are any others who found even better hiding places. He still believes his betrayed kin can be saved, though. Or Saima. Orcs, also known as the Pariah Elves, descended from a race of elves who got screwed over by Diedrich Fagatry. Most Or Saima live assimilated into other cultures or in destitute and isolated strongholds akin to native reservations far out in the wilderness. Every time they tried to re build their city-state of Orsinium somewhere in High Rock or Himerthal, the Bretons or Ridgewoods came and knocked it over. And as of the fourth era, Orsinium exists somewhere on the Skyrim-Himerthal border. Due to all the shit they've taken, 
the orcs developed a warrior culture and also became renowned blacksmiths. Their martial prowess is such that even the Nords wish they could be as hardcore, but rather than eternal enmity, this created an odd friendship between the two races. Finally, it is worth noting that at the time of the first two games, they weren't even considered people by Tamrelic culture. But by the time of Oblivion nobody would think twice about walking into a shop to find that it was run by an orc any more than they would a shopkeeper of any of the other playable races. Beast Monargonians, a race of warm-blooded lizard people, well spoken and skilled as both warriors and mages, have a weird connection to omniscient networked spore trees known as the Hist. They may or may not be a genetically engineered servant race mind linked to the Hist, as hinted by Argonians starting their lives as perfectly ordinary lizards that only gain sapience and humanoid physique upon licking Hist sap. Despite being weirdos and the targets of discrimination, they have an unbreakable hold on their homeland. Even Tiber Septim never truly conquered Black Marsh. He just barely secured some of the border towns and called it a win, which the Argonians didn't care enough to contest. During the Oblivion Crisis, the invading Dedra were eventually forced to close their interdimensional portals because the Argonians were counter-invading fire and brimstone hell. When they aren't deploying wave tactics or sending child assassins to preemptively cut off the enemy leadership, Argonians are masters of Viet Cong style jungle warfare and invading black marsh is about as big a military mistake as challenging Britain to a naval war or marching on Russia in winter, as the province is a veritable green hell where every blade of grass conceals an angry lizardman just waiting to spear you to death or drag you under the mud and drown you, if your feet or eyes don't rot first. KGite, technically related to elves, but hard to tell by looking because they have many different forms that are determined at birth by the waxing and waning of Massa and Secunda. Some KGI look like Bosma, some like furries, some look like housecuts except they can talk and use magic, and some get to be completely bad as horse-sized tigers, named battlecuts by the Imperials. They are skilled desert raiders, merchants and farmers. Their culture is basically the Romani outside of their homeland and South Southeast Asian within. The prime KGIT export is moon sugar, a substance that can be best described as magical opium made from crystallized moonlight. Like the Argonians they are a prime target for racism, and like the Argonians they responded by becoming skilled guerrilla warriors, except flavored like the Mujahideen instead of the Viet Cong. Other giants, giant humanoids said to be descended from the ancient Atmorans which would make them and the modern Nords distant cousins. Funnily enough, that after an undisclosed calamity grew in height at the cost of their intelligence. Generally a quite chill, nomadic people, unless you piss them off by annoying them or just looking wrong at their primary domesticated livestock, mammoths. That said, big numbers of them can cause a lot of trouble for humans and frequently find themselves as targets of bounty hunters or armies some more traditionally minded nords also like to hunt them for sport dragons dragons are the timeless children of akatosh with alduin as their leader their origin is kind of like a big bang theory ordeal that is complicated to explain used to be sapphire keepers of the flow of time in the world until Alduin betrayed his purpose and enslaved the ancient Nords during the Marethic era, installing an unimaginably dystopic regime under the leadership of the dragon cult and its priests. Said dragon cult also built the many tombs your PC steps through in Skyrim. Their way of communicating involves imparting a piece of your soul with every word you speak, using shouts with quite substantial effects on the physical world which makes fighting and debating between them the exact same thing. Due to a quirk of fate, some mortals can be born as dragonborn, mortals with the soul of a dragon that are able to absorb the soul of a dragon, and therefore erasing its very existence from time itself, and become more powerful from it. True dragonborn, however, are extremely rare, with only a handful ever being mentioned in recorded history, including Tiber Septim the first emperor and sometimes entire generations going by without one appearing. Moreover, normal mortals are also quite capable of learning how to use shouts, extreme caution and a tremendous amount of training provided, 
The Dragonborn is merely a natural prodigy at this. They were for the longest time thought to be extinct after the ancient Nords rose up in revolt against Alduin and his dragon cults and seemingly killed a lot of them. Only with their plan to kill Alduin failing. Their plan B was to banish Alduin into another plane of existence with the help of an Elder Scroll. But the plan failed and Alduin was merely sent forward in time by about 5000 years. Setting the events of Tez 5. Skyrim into motion. While the majority of dragons seem to be firmly unified behind Alduin's leadership, there are quite a couple of them that retained their own agency, like the dragon Parthenax who pitted the Nords while being very turned off by Alduin declaring himself a god and gifted them his knowledge about using shouts, or the semi-undead dragon Dernivia who dabbled in necromancy and was subsequently tricked by the ideal masters who keep him as their enforcer within the soul cam. Vampires. Undead. Classic gothic horror vampires for the most part. Their origins lie in the unspeakable act of Moloch Bal literally and figuratively raping a Nedic woman to her death and damning her to eternal servitude in unlife. Vampires live in hidden covens among mortals in the world greatly enjoying pulling the strings behind political affairs of the world and generally just going around sucking people dry. Becoming a vampire typically involves getting bitten by one, which transmits various germs that make up the root cause of vampirism itself. Vampires that don't dwell amongst the living tend to gather in cult-like structures, with the most senior vampire at the top. Above all of them stand the vampires that can trace their lineage back to the original daughter of Cold Harbor, a aforementioned woman that was raped, and openly worship Moloch Bal as a god, which earns them special powers. There is also the option for mortals who pledge themselves to Moloch Bal to repeat the ritual that gave birth to the first vampire. Nearly all of Tamriel despises vampires and hunts them down without mercy when found out, especially those who worship the god of mercy, Stender, but they are occasionally tolerated, even if their vampirism remains an open secret to some. Draugr. Draugr occupy a middle ground in terms of undeath between the fully autonomous vampires with their own ambitions and the fully lobotomized shells necromancers conjure. They are the embalmed foot soldiers of the dragon cult, who in life pledge their souls to its priests for eternal life. In spite of their undead condition, they remain quite lively when left alone. Even if their free will is diminished greatly and their souls are mere fragments that get slowly leached away by the dragon priests who need this kind of spiritual nourishment to retain their abilities and consciousness. To sides an allegory, regular undead work like computers that need input to do something while Draugr are running on unsophisticated army. The extremely long time they spent buried in various tombs in Skyrim and Sarodial had their physical capabilities reduced, yet they remain fearsome adversaries for anyone who is daring, or foolish, enough to disturb their master's peace. Dragon priests, technically not a race on their own. They are different and important enough to at least merit a mention. The dragon priests were the leaders of the dragon cult, numbering 14 in total. Their sole responsibility was to keep the enslaved Nords in line and under Anduin's control, while regularly partaking in joyous activities such as necromancy, dark magic and human sacrifices. Each and every one of them was and is a master at spellcasting and commanding their legions of Draugr, who keep them sustained by slowly leeching away at the Draugr's souls. The most powerful of them was Mirak, who, in addition to being dragonborn, made a pact with Hermaris Mora to take control of the dragons themselves and subsequently betrayed the dragon cult only to return thousands of years later on Souls theme games. Though several spin-offs were made, when referring to the Elder Scrolls only the five central games are being referred to. The Elder Scrolls 1, Arena, Jagathan, the Imperial Battle Mage and trusted servant of the Emperor Uriel Septim 7th turns evil locks the Emperor inside oblivion and takes over Tamriel. His apprentice Raya Silmane discovered this and told the player, so Thon killed the former and imprisoned the latter. Yet Silmane persisted and helped the player escape prison and revealed how Thon could be destroyed by recovering the eight parts of the Staff of Chaos from all over the Empire. The player succeeds, kills Thon, returns the Emperor and all is well. This was the only game where the player could visit all of Tamriel. The Elder Scrolls 2, Daggerfall. The player, a personal friend of the Emperor, 
is sent to the city of Daggerfall, High Rock to investigate a haunting by the ghost of the former king. Things quickly get out of hand when you discover the new Miriam, a massive golem used by Tiber Septim to gain control over Tamriel. There are several mutually exclusive endings possible. Cannon opted to make them all happen in an event called the Warp in the West, a dragon break, which is a specific type of event where divine fuckery causes time and space to take it up the ass hard. Holds the record for the largest virtual world ever created, being about two times the size of the UK. Although due to technical limitations, most of it was copy and paste. The Elder Scrolls 3, Morrowind. Morrowind ships the player to the island of Vardenfall, in the Dunma province of Morrowind where you are to report to the perpetually shirtless crackhead called Keys Cassades to investigate a cult that is growing rapidly in size. This cult is revealed to be the doings of the Sixth House, a clan of Dunma that was destroyed after its leader, Lord Vorin Dagath, rebelled against Lord Indural Nereva, the leader of the war against the Dwemer. Nereva died shortly afterwards, though it is unclear if he died from the wounds Dagath inflicted on him, or that his advisors. The tribunal murdered their lord so they could use the tools of the Dwemer to grant themselves near divinity, and the tribunal took over as the god kings of the Dunma. There was only one problem. Dagath wasn't actually dead, and he granted himself near divinity too. He's also completely insane because mortal minds simply were not meant to handle that kind of power. And now he is using a divine disease to influence the dreams of a bunch of Dunma nationalists. Transforming them into horrifying humanoid cephalopods hellbent on driving the Empire and all the other races out of Morrowind. You take the role of Nereva's reincarnation, the Nereverine. And long story short you kill Dagath properly this time. However two of the tribunal lie dead and the last one sacrificed his divinity to help you. Things in Morrowind do not get better after this. The Elder Scrolls 4. Oblivion. You play as a nobody prisoner rotting in a cell in the Imperial City in the waning years of the Third Era. You catch a break when Emperor Patrick Stewart Uriel Septim Vinay pays a visit to your cell because his escape tunnel happens to be in there with you. It's chalked up to fate or a bureaucratic error. Turns out his heirs have been assassinated, and despite the best efforts of you and Sir Odial's finest, the Emperor gets shanked too. Before he does however, he entrusts you with the Amulet of Kings and tells you to go look for the Emperor's last son, a bastard child named Martin, who is voiced by Sean Bean, who is also being sought out by an apocalyptic cult of Merun's Dagon led by the last known child of the Camorum dynasty. The family who had ruled over man for years before Street. Alish that year came and slapped their shit down. By the events of the ending, Merun's Dagon's attempted invasion has been thwarted and Tamriel has been saved from a truly horrifying outcome. But Martin is dead and the Septim Empire is officially left without an heir. Things in Tamriel do not get better after this. It was the first big name RPG to appear on 7th generation consoles and made the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 work for their money. The Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, also known as the Volsunga Saga, the game chronologically set 201 years after Oblivion. It's been a long time and a lot has happened. Basically the Empire went to shit. A faction of Ultima Supremacists named the Tharma took over the Somerset Isles and seceded. Also annexing Valenwood and turning elsewhere into a client state. Morrowind got properly fucked because the Red Mountain erupted and the northern half of the country was left uninhabitable. The Argonians invaded the southern half as payback for years of slavery. And what isn't run by vengeful ex-slave lizards or covered in burning ashes in the midst of a political vacuum caused by the collapse of the pro-imperial house Halalu. Then the newly christened Old Marie Dominion declared war on the Empire and even sacked the Imperial City. The Imperial Legion drove them out at great cost but the Emperor, Titus Medii, was forced to sign a ceasefire with several punitive terms including a ban on Talos worship and giving up parts of Hammerfall. These terms especially the Talos ban, were controversial to say the least. Hammerfall, fed up with the fuckery of the elves and the empire at this point, kicked them both out and declared independence. Between this and their handling of the Oblivion Crisis and the Red Mountain Eruption, many people within the empire began seeing it as weak and ineffectual, 
selling out the non Sarodialic peoples to save their own sorry heights, but for now, an uneasy cold war exists between the two empires and everybody knows round 2 is just around the corner. You're a prisoner, but in a shocking turn of events, this time you're actually told why this time turns out you cross the damn border illegally, you filthy alien. Of course if you are a Nor or a High Elf then it's just chalked up to an asshole Imperial officer who doesn't want to deal with the paperwork and sends you to the block along with everyone else. See, at this point the Imperial authorities in Skyrim are very uneasy because there is a civil war going on between the pro-Imperial de facto High Queen Elisith Affair and the eponymous forces of Jarl Ulfric Stormcloak. A former Legion soldier turned Nor Warlord who took umbrage to the terms of the ceasefire with the Dominion and now wants to drive out the Empire and claim the throne. So he is basically the Nor version of Robert the Bruce, even down to the controversial murder of a noble puppet that has made him effectively an outlaw king. He is also quite awesomely voiced by Vladimir Kulik, but he was captured and is going to get executed with you. Just mere moments before the frosty looking bloke with the big axe gives you a discount haircut. A giant dragon god named Alju in the world eater. Nidhogg with a touch of Jumungunda. Although his purpose makes him more similar to Fenrir, decides to introduce himself to the world after being banished for ages and begins fucking up the town. Giving you, Ulfric and his men a chance to escape while everyone but Ulfric thinks the dragon is part of Ulfric's plan. In truth Alduin is there for you, you end up learning that you're the legendary dragonborn, a mortal with the soul of a dragon who can basically do any of the cool shit a real dragon can do, besides flying, leaving you to solve the mystery of why the mysterious dragons are returning and find a way to stop Alduin from eating the world and possibly also end the civil war by leading either side to victory, leading to either an independent new Skyrim. Stormcloaks win, or a reinvigorated empire that holds onto its most vital province and is a key figure of the dragon blood once again, leaving it in the best state it has been in decades. Imperials win. Either way, neither side likes the Almary Dominion and war is on the horizon. Gameplay wise, it's very scubby. Many people praise the sandbox approach to the gameplay itself and the scale of the map. Others criticize the lack of complexity in both gameplay and storylines. People nowadays just mod better looking women and play it for adult action anyway. The Elder Scrolls Online Tez, the morgue. Early on it suffered from growing pains and problems, but after surviving the hate and becoming only by to play, it became a rather nice game. It is set in the second era. 800 years before Oblivion and a full millennium before Skyrim. Tamriel is currently locked in a Millier grave choice between three fragile alliances all vying for the Imperial throne. The Ebonhead Pact, Norts, Dunmer and Argonians, the Aldmeri Dominion, Altmer, Bosmer and Kajiite, and the Daggerfall Covenant, Bretons, Reduids and Orcs. You can also play Imperials if you upgraded your account to the Imperial Edition. They can join any of the three alliances. Meanwhile behind the scenes Molag Bal is scheming to meld Mundus with his Nightmare Realm Cold Harbor and enslave all the mortal races. Someone ought to stop that shit. Right the game had a very rough release, with Elder Scrolls players criticizing it for missing the series' aesthetics and feel, and MMO players for the lackluster endgame, and also for its expensive subscription. Same price as WoW, but without the decade worth of content. However the game received praise for its Cyrodiil PvP map. Fast forward a couple of years and various updates. The most notable one being one Tamriel which completely overhauled the game's balance and dropped the subscription and had various DLCs released which added multiple zones, classes and dungeons. All in all the game today is a decent MMO, with a thriving and relatively non-toxic community. However the game's plot is lackluster compared to other Elder Scrolls games, and it has a notable lack of iconic characters. Especially if compared to World of Warcraft. The Elder Scrolls Legends. A collectible card game for PC and mobile. The Elder Scrolls Blades. A mobile game that everyone forgot about. It was kinda bad. The Elder Scrolls 6. Announced at E3 2018.
the game was confirmed to be in production. The trailer shows a mountainous eastern or western coast with some stone ruins. Bethesda has been completely silent on it and the simultaneously announced Starfield since their announcements, leading to many claiming vaporware.